In 1975, the economy of the richest country on Earth was broken. Unemployment in America was worse in 1975 than in 2020. And at the same time, inflation was also out of control. According to rudimentary economics, that's not supposed to happen. The vice president gave a speech that year saying one person ought to teach the US government how to run a country. And that was the Shah of Iran. Iran was a radically different place in the 70s. This Middle Eastern monarchy was secular. It was urban. Women went to universities sporting short skirts and big hair. Some of its social welfare policies were more progressive than Sweden. Sweden! And it was getting rich. The middle class was booming. The Shah was handing out loans to Britain and the United States. The country's GDP per capita was only about seven years behind contemporaries like Germany or Japan. And that gap was closing in fast. That lasted until 1978. And in 1979, Iran was a dystopian police state at the mercy of a supreme leader whose primary export is human rights violations. Revolutions are always complicated, but this one is... Weird. I can't, I can't believe, believe this! It. The Shah discovered ten new elements this afternoon. The Shah turned all our drinking water into hot sauce! Hey, mister. Just where do you get off spouting that kind of malarkey? Fellas, fellas, let's not lose our heads. Media profits on stories that make you mad and validate your pre-existing beliefs. If you want a full picture, you need an app or website that gathers and compares news coverage from all over the world. That's why I use Ground News. For every story, you get a quick visual breakdown of the news outlets reporting on it, their political bias, how factual the source is, which entity owns the source, and which countries are covering the story. Why, just this week, Iran was in the headlines as a UN report showed the country was slowing its development of weapons-grade uranium. Though the International Atomic Energy Agency continues to face challenges in monitoring the Iranian nuclear program closely. You can also discover stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum using the blind spot feed for a better look at the whole picture. But where do I go to find Ground News? Go to ground.news slash jack today to avoid propaganda and bias in the media. And thank you Ground News for sponsoring this video. Mohammad Reza Shah is the name of our star tonight. When he came to power in 1941, he realized it's not easy being the Shah. First of all, he had to keep the British happy. The British were the ones who put his dad in charge, and when they weren't happy with the way he was running things, they invaded and sent him far away to a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean. And of course, when the British invaded, it was during the middle of World War II, so they invited their friends the Soviets, and the Soviets never pick up after themselves. They left behind all these separatist republics and communist parties that now the Shah has to clean up, and as soon as that's over with, some schmuck in parliament starts saying things like, maybe Iran shouldn't be ruled by an authoritarian monarchy, and maybe the Shah should go into exile. But foreign spies and the Iranian military cooked up a surprise birthday present for the Shah. Okay, take a look. My old palace! Just like you left it. We knew it meant a lot to you, so we overthrew the government. But why? Oh, the Prime Minister wanted to mess with Britain's oil refineries, so we told everyone he was a dirty commie and the rest took care of itself. This is the sweetest thing anyone's ever done for me. Weird thing is, the Shah turned out to be a competent and strangely progressive leader. Just managing to survive the 1950s and navigate the complicated web of relationships with the United States, the USSR, Great Britain, the military strongman who put him in power, Iranian communists, Islamists, the middle class, parliament, and the military, that was no small miracle. He even managed to tap into some of the country's oil money that was being controlled by foreign companies. The crown jewel of his his reign was a policy known as the White Revolution. The Shah promised his people they would soon have the same standard of living as the West. He expanded voting rights for women, he built schools and roads, he redistributed land to the poor and required factories to give 20% of their profits directly to their workers. All the while, the country kept getting richer and richer. The growing middle class liked this state of affairs quite a lot, but the holy priest Ayatollah Khomeini did not. His hopes for the country he held close to his chest, but one thing he shared, the Shah didn't know best. 
This country's off track. If I don't act soon, there'll be no more place for traditional values. Then he steepled his fingers and tightened his shoes. I'll see this Shah finished, if it's the last thing I do. There were, as a matter of fact, a lot of reasons to hate the Shah, even more than the ones Khomeini said out loud. The Shah was highly corrupt. One time he awarded a government contract to the first sales agent who let him sleep with his wife. His attempts to make Iran culturally European were not appreciated. His father had gone so far as to outlaw the hijab, which for some women was humiliating. A loose comparison I've heard is how American women might feel if they were forced to go topless. He persecuted members of the Baha'i faith whose whole thing is that they love and support all religions. And, lest we forget, the Shah conspired with foreign governments to overthrow Iran's democratically elected prime minister. And yet somehow, the Shah seemed to learn absolutely nothing from that experience. The schmuck was overthrown after the people began to see him as a tyrannical radical who used violence against his opponents and hated Islam. Then the Shah decides to create secret police, publicly shoot protesters, implement a one-party state, and create a new calendar based on Cyrus the Great instead of Muhammad. So Khomeini's followers are outside the royal palace chanting death to the Shah. As far as I can tell, Khomeini at this point was only a rabble rouser using harsh rhetoric. But violence seemed to lurk in his shadow. The Prime Minister slapped him once, and was assassinated two months later. Khomeini eventually got in trouble with the law. The Shah was partial to killing Khomeini, but the head of the secret police talked him out of it, and eventually, Khomeini was exiled instead. But now consider. Everyone inside of Iran who hated the Shah had to watch their backs for secret police whenever they wanted to say something, but Khomeini could smuggle cassette tapes into the country and say whatever the heck he wanted. So who is every unhappy Iranian going to be listening to? Khomeini! This does not bode well for the Shah when Khomeini's son dies under mysterious circumstances. Khomeini blames the secret police. Every 40 days, Khomeini organizes protests around the country. Every 40 days, the police don't know what to do, and every 40 days, they call in the army. Every 40 days, the army opens fire, and every 40 days, Khomeini's protests get bigger. The Shah was actually busy dying of cancer, so he took the unconventional approach of giving the protesters what they wanted. He started replacing hardline officials with moderates, he relaxed censorship, he promised to reduce corruption, he even appointed a new prime minister. Okay, when the people protest, concede to their demands before they even make them. Atta boy! The Shah undid the imperial calendar, undid the one-party system, closed down casinos and nightclubs, even shrank the secret police. This has gotta be the most effective protest in the history of authoritarian regimes. But the protests didn't stop. The flames of revolution were stoked again by the largest terror attack in history before 9-11. A whole movie theater was locked from the outside and burned to the ground. There's no clear proof who did it, it certainly ended up being a big boost for Khomeini, but if the Shah has secret police who operate outside the law to kill his political opponents, even a small amount of secret police who operate outside the law to kill his political opponents, if one of his political opponents may have been in the theater, people are going to blame the secret police who kill political opponents. Nonetheless, the Shah continued his policy of kill them with kindness when you're not killing them with fire or bullets. In order to curb the growing violence, I am temporarily implementing martial law. Please return to your homes after dark and know that I am committed to expanding your civil liberties as soon as the crisis has passed. Boo! He's out after dark! A whole crowd of people who may or may not have even heard about the curfew got shot by the military, and more and more citizens find themselves flocking to Khomeini. The Shah opens negotiations with the protesters, but just when he does, oil refineries around the country go on strike and shut down the economy. Okay, I understand you're mad, but I support your right to organize negotiations I'm gonna continue paying your wages, and if any of you are living in public housing, I will not evict you. This is around the point where the US might have stepped in and done something to keep the Shah in charge, but the Shah jacked up oil prices on them a few years ago. No, this is good, this is good. We get brownie points for promoting democracy. 
you'll be the prime minister, and uh, you're gonna be like a uh, Persian Gandhi, right? Yes, Gandhi. Meanwhile, in the strangest end to a revolution I can recall, the Shah continued to make concessions until eventually, he just conceded the monarchy. He appointed a prime minister from the opposition party, hopped on a plane, and was never seen again. But the violence had only just begun. Ayatollah Khomeini, we are all so happy to welcome you back to your home. What are you feeling right now? Nothing. <laughs> well, the new government, we're working on creating a, a Muslim Vatican in the holy city of Qom with you as our spiritual leader. I am going to kick your teeth in. I appoint the government. I appoint the government in this nation. War breaks out between Khomeini and the prime minister, but it doesn't last long. Khomeini's been the voice of this revolution the whole time. He's way too popular. Military bases and weapons factories across the country are seized either from the outside or from the inside by his followers, and the prime minister surrenders. Khomeini! Khomeini, it's me. I, I'm, I'm the one who talked to the Shah. I saved your life. You shouldn't have. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all. The Shah has fled to the West, where his true loyalties lie. And here, now, we have created God's government. I want to thank the faithful, who these many years have fought for justice. Without you, we could not have issued summary executions. I want to thank the liberals. Without you, we could not have done away with democratic rule. I want to thank the many women who have participated in this movement. Without you... I love you, Ayatollah! Without you, we could not have whipped her for showing her hair in public. And now, we can all live happily ever after.